Chapter 34 Theophilus awakened with the dawn's light coming through a narrow break in the roof. Rizpa and Atreides were still sleeping. He shook Atreides' shoulder, awakening him. I'll be out in the woods, praying. Atreides sat up and rubbed his face. His head ached from too much beer, but he nodded. Give us a minute, and we'll go with you. Theophilus, Atreides, and Rizpa, with Caleb in her arms, walked out into the forest and prayed together as the sun came up. The air was crisp, dew heavy upon the grass. Theophilus surprised Atreides by praying for Varus. He gives you a stall near the pigs, and you pray for him? I prayed for you from the day of our first meeting, Atreides, and you hated me no less than your brother. When Varus looks at me, he sees Rome, just as you did. When he insults you, he insults me. Theophilus' mouth curved. A man who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, Atreides, and he who rules his spirit is greater than any warrior who captures a city. You did battle with your brother last night. What did you win by it? I told him the truth. You beat him over the head with the gospel, and he heard and understood none of it. All the while you sat silent, Atreides said through his teeth. Why? You were saying too much, Theophilus said as gently as he could. Listen to me, friend. Lay aside your pride, or it will entangle you in sin. Anger is your worst enemy. It served you well in the arena, but not here. When you give into it, you're like a city without walls. A man's anger doesn't bring forth the righteousness of God. What would you have me do? Fix your eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Be zealous, but be patient. It was love that made the Lord give up his heavenly throne to walk upon us as a man. It was love that held him on the cross and raised him from the dead. And it is love that will win your people to him. My people don't understand love. They understand power. There is no power on earth that can overcome the love of God in Christ Jesus. Atreides exhaled a derisive laugh. This from a man who once used the butt of his sword on the side of my head. He sat down on a log and thrust his fingers through his hair in frustration. I'm not perfect, Theophilus said with a rueful smile. He hunkered down. Noticing a pine cone, he picked it up. A few pine nuts fell into his hand. I will give you the words, Jesus said. He cast the pine cone away and held the seeds in his palm. Behold, a sower went out to sow, and it came about that as he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate it. Another seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and it immediately sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it and it yielded no crop. And other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. He scattered the pine nuts. You and I and Rizba will sow the word of God among your people. Brushing off his hands, he stood. Whether the seed takes root and grows or not isn't up to us, Atreides. It's up to the Lord. Frasia and Varus were standing in front of the longhouse when they returned. Frasia's worried frown turned to relief when she saw them. She stretched out her hands to Atreides as he came back. I awakened, and you were gone. He took her hands, bending down to kiss her on each cheek. We pray each morning as the day begins. So early? Atreides looked past her to Varus, grim and withdrawn. He released his mother's hands and went to his brother. You trusted me once, Varus. You followed me in battle. You fought beside me. No brother ever showed more courage than you. He held out his hand. I want no animosity between us. No, I do I, Vara said, taking the proffered hand, yearning for the old times when they had laughed and gotten drunk together. Eleven years had passed, and his brother had finally returned, bringing with him a dark, foreign wife and son, a Roman he called friend, and a new god. How could he think things would be the same? The cattle have to be pastured. It occurred to Varus as he said it that the land he now held would revert to his brother as well. Resentment and jealousy filled him. Theophilus can help us. Keep him away from me, or I swear by Tewaz, I'll kill him. As he turned away, a traitor started after him. Theophilus caught his arm. Leave him be. It wasn't many days ago when you felt the same way. A traitor jerked his arm away, but breathed out slowly, forcing his temper down. Theophilus was right. Patience. He had to have patience. It will take time for me to make a place among your people. The place? Frasia stared at Theophilus in horror. She swung to her son, appealing to him. You cannot mean to let him stay here among us, not after all that has happened at the hands of Rome. 
Theophilus is here at my invitation, mother, a traitor said. Tight-lipped as he saw, she too was fighting him. As a brother, not as a Roman. I am thankful he saved your life, but last night should have made it clear this Roman has no place among us. Would you fight me as well? He stays. What's happened to you? Romans killed your father. They killed Rolf and Dolga and half our tribe. There isn't one person among us who hasn't suffered tragedy at the hands of Rome. And you would dare to bring this man here to make a home among us? I dare. She turned to Theophilus. They will kill you. They'll try, Theophilus conceded softly. Surprised, she saw he had no fear of death. Do you think this god of yours will protect you? Every man among the Chatti will have plot to murder you. If anyone touches him, they'll contend with me. You will contend with all if he remains. You will have to set yourself against your own people. Neither man was swayed by her warning. A traitor's jaw was set. The Roman looked at her with compassion. She knew her son's stubbornness and so appealed to Theophilus for reason. A traitor's calls you friend. What will happen to you if you stay? It would be worse for him if I left. Freja was greatly disturbed by his words, for she sensed powerful forces moving. What power do you have over my son? None, my lady. Despite his reassurance, she was afraid. She felt a warning tingle and coldness as a spirit came upon her. Not now, she thought desperately, fighting it. Not now. Her vision narrowed and darkened, and images appeared, unclear and moving. No, she moaned, her soul struggling and weakening as the force took hold. She saw Rizpa sitting on the forest floor, weeping as she held a man in her arms. She saw blood. Madar, Atreide said, chilled. He had seen her look like this before and knew what it meant. What do you say? Lady Frasia, Rispa said, alarmed and wanting to help her. Atreide shoved her back. Leave her alone. She's ill. She's having a vision. You must not touch her when she's like this. Frasia was fighting and losing against whatever possessed her. Her eyelids fluttered, her eyes rolling back as she trembled violently. It's never happened like this before, Atreide said, afraid to touch her lest he bring worse upon her. Death. Frasia clutched the pendant over her heart, terrified. I see death. She groaned. But whose? She couldn't see the dying man clearly. The vision intensified with terrifying power. Someone, or something, else was in the forest with them. Something dark and malevolent. We must help her, Rispa said, her spirit moved by the woman's anguish. Theophilus felt the presence of some dark force holding Frasia. Compelled, he stepped forward. In the name of Jesus Christ, leave her, he said in a quiet, firm voice. The vision ended so abruptly, Frasia gasped. Disoriented, she sagged forward. It was the Roman who caught hold of her and gave her support. Do not be afraid, he said gently, and warmth flowed through her at his touch. The coldness within her fled. Alarmed, she drew back from him, eyes wide. Do not touch me, it is forbidden. Seeing her eyes were clear and focused again, Theophilus released her. She stepped back from him, eyes wide. He wanted to reassure her, but knew nothing he could say at this moment would allay her fears. Time. Lord, I need time in your health if I'm to reach these people. Still trembling, Frasia turned to her son and took his hand between hers. Walk among your people, Atreides. You must find yourself again before it's too late. She let go of him and hurried away. Milady, Rispa said, snatching up Caleb and starting after her. Atreides grasped her arm, keeping her at his side. Let her go. But she looked ill, Atreides. She shouldn't be alone. You can't follow. She's going to the sacred wood. Anomia was out gathering herbs when she saw Frasia walking hurriedly through the forest. Her eyes narrowed. Mother Frasia! She called in greeting, affronted when the older woman didn't pause until she called again. It was clear Frasia didn't want to be disturbed by anyone, not even another priestess. As Anomia came near, she noticed the pallor of the woman's skin and the torpidness of her blue eyes. Jealousy gripped her as she read the signs that the spirit had come upon Frasia again. Why do you deny me to us? Her soul cried out in anger as she greeted the elder priestess with a kiss. You look distressed, Lady Frasia, she said, pretending concern. Why? I've had a vision, Frasia said, wary of the younger woman. She had never fully trusted her. I must be alone. Tiwas has revealed the future to you again? Yes. What did you see? Frasia in the forest, holding a dying man. A traitor? Anomia said in alarm. I don't know. Fraser said, shaken. The man wasn't clear, and there was someone or something else with them. 
Perhaps Tiwaz will reveal more to you if you sacrifice. Freja put a trembling hand to her forehead. I'm not sure I want to know more, she said, looking ill. Anomia hid her contempt. As a child, she had been in awe of Freja, for she was the chosen one of Tiwaz. Now, she saw her as weak and foolish. Freja didn't welcome the power that came upon her. She didn't use the hold it gave her over the chatty. It had been four years since the spirit had last possessed Freja, and she had prophesied. She had said Markobus, chief of the Herminduri, would be murdered by a woman. His death would bring anarchy and bloodshed to the underchiefs as each strove to lead. The Chatty had rejoiced at Freja's vision. Why shouldn't they? The Hermanduri had once triumphed over them and stolen a river salt plat. Freja, however, had not rejoiced. She had gone into seclusion, distressed by the violence of what she had seen. Foolish, gentle Freja. Anomia wondered why Tiwaz would use such a weak vassal when she herself was so much more worthy. She had sacrificed and prayed to Tiwaz that he would set Freja aside in her favor. She had held the sacred horns and spoken the vows before the priest, Gundred. She had given herself to Tiwaz. Since then, her powers had eclipsed those of the older woman, and even of Gundred. He was afraid of her, and though Freja wasn't, her powers had seemed to decrease, for no further visions came. After a year, Anomia had begun to think that Tiwaz had finally discarded Freja. After four years, she had been certain of it. Surely the Dark Lord had chosen her now, for her powers and beauty had increased greatly during the long silence. The chatty men held her in awe, the women in fear. But now, Tiwa spoke again through Freja. Why? she wanted to scream. I have given my soul to you. Do you give her the vision to taunt me? Do you mock my devotion? Why do you come upon this poor, pathetic creature who has the effrontery to look ill after being blessed by your possession? Take me. I would be triumphant. I would exult in it. Only I am worthy among these pitiful people. Why won't you take me? And all the while her mind rebelled, she smiled and spoke softly. Rest, mother. I will see to the services this evening. You needn't worry about anything. Her mind whirred. How had she displeased Tiwaz that he would betray her with Freja? Didn't she devote herself to sacrifice and service to him? Didn't she perform the rites in the moonlight? Didn't she use her magic to bring people into submission to him? Why did Tiwa still speak through this pathetic weakling? I must go, Freja said. She wanted to escape Anomia, for she sensed the dark undercurrents swirling around her. Those speak later. Anomia's brow arched slightly at being so summarily dismissed, but Freja was too distraught to care. She left the young priestess standing among the trees, fingers white upon the handle of her basket. Freja knew Anomia coveted her long-held position among the chatty. She often prayed that Tiwaz would give Anomia what she wanted. For herself, she had never wanted to have the spirit take hold of her and open her eyes to the things that were to come. It had never sat easy with her. Each time it happened, she felt more of herself draining away. The first time the god had come upon her, she had been a child. She was sitting in her mother's lap when everything around her faded and other things had taken their place. She had seen a woman having a child. The vision lasted only a moment and had not manifested itself in any unusual way. When the vision ebbed, she was still sitting on her mother's lap before the fire in the longhouse. Everyone was talking around her. Her father was laughing and drinking mead with his friends. Thela is going to have a baby, she said. Watch this, you say? Thela is going to have a baby, she said again. She liked babies. Everyone rejoiced when they came. A baby will make Thela happy, won't it? You've had a dream, Lee Kven, her mother said sadly. Thela would be very happy to have a baby, but she's barren. She and Buri have been married five years. I saw her have a baby. Her mother looked across at her father, and he lowered his drinking horn. What's Freja saying to you? She said Sayla's going to have a baby, her mother said. A child with a dream, he said, dismissing it. No one thought much about the vision. Only Freja knew the truth of it. She sought out Sayla and told her what she had seen. The dream only seemed to increase the woman's sorrow, and so she stopped talking about the baby though continuing to spend time with the woman. In the fall of the following year, Sela conceived, to the amazement of everyone in the tribe. She bore a son in the early summer. Everyone treated Fraser differently after that. When she had visions, they listened and believed. The early visions were good. Babies were born. Marriages took place. Battles were won. When she foresaw Ermun, only a few years older than she, would be chief one day, her father and mother had arranged her marriage with him. It was only later that the visions became dark and foreboding. The last portent of good had come in the wake of disaster. Rome had destroyed the alliance between the tribes, crushing the rebellion. 
Air Moon was dead. Atreides, the new chief of the Chatti. She had seen her son's future. He would become known in Rome. He would fight as no other Chatti had fought, and he would triumph over every foe. A storm would come that would blow across the empire and destroy it. It would come from the north and the east and the west, and Atreides would be a part of it. And there would be a woman, a woman with dark hair and dark eyes, a woman of strange ways whom he would love. It was when all others had thought Atreides dead that she had had another vision prophesying his return, and that he would bring peace with him. Now, she was confused and torn. Part of the vision had already proven true. Atreides had achieved fame in Rome. He had fought as a gladiator and had triumphed over every foe in order to earn his freedom and return home. And he had brought with him a woman of dark hair and dark eyes, a woman of strange beliefs whom he clearly loved. But peace? Where was the peace she had seen with his return? He brought rebellion and blasphemy and heartache. In one night, her family was being torn apart before her very eyes. A new god? The only god. How can he say such things? How can he believe them? And what of the storm that would blow across the empire and destroy it? Freja reached the sacred grove and went down on her knees on hallowed ground. Clutching the pendant, she bowed down before the ancient tree that held the golden horns. I am unworthy of your possession, do you ask? Prostrating herself, she wept. Anomia found Gundred in the meadowlands to the east of the sacred wood. He was leading one of the sacred white horses in a circle, speaking softly to it and listening intently to whatever snorts or neighs it uttered. What did she tell you? Anomia asked, startling him. He untied the rope from around the mare's neck, giving himself time to think before facing the young priestess with an answer. In truth, he had just been enjoying the animal, speaking his affection for her. Running a hand down her side, he patted her haunches and sent her galloping toward the other two white horses grazing in the sunlight. Holt will bring back good news, he said. Whatever news Holt brought with him, he could interpret to fulfill his statement, be it rebellion against Rome or a time of waiting. Anomia smiled faintly, suspect. Freja has had another vision. She has. He saw Anomia's blue eyes flicker and knew he should have hidden his pleasure at the news. Freja. She's praying before the sacred emblems, she said. And weeping. Her tone turned acrid. I'll go and speak with her. She came closer so that he would have to go around her to depart. Why does Tiwa still use her? You must ask Tiwa's. I have. He gives me no answer. What of the sacred horses? What do they tell you, Gundred? That you have great power, he said, well aware of what she wanted to hear. I want more, she said with unveiled discontent, then added with less vehemence, that I might serve our people better. Gundred knew Anomia lied. He was well aware she craved the power for her own purposes, and not for the benefit of her people. He was, will use you, as he wills, he said, secretly hoping the god would continue to speak through Freja, who longed for the good of her people and not power herself. Anomia watched him walk away, the carved staff in his hand. Atreides returned last night. Atreides, he said, turning back in surprise. Is he here? Did not the sacred horse tell you that? She walked toward him with measured steps. He brought a Roman with him and a dark woman he calls his wife. Both spoke of another god, a god more powerful than he was. Sacrilege. Is it any wonder Freja sees blood and death in the forest? Who's death? She didn't say. She shrugged. I don't think she knows. Tiwaz only reveals a little to her. A hint of what's to come. Perhaps the god would reveal the whole of it to her if she gave him blood sacrifice. She looked at the old priest and wished she could offer him. He was a fraud, currying the sacred horse's hides rather than their spirits. He saw nothing. He knew nothing. I will see him after I have spoken with Freja, he said, and left her. He found her, still kneeling, in the wood. Freja rose in respect as he approached her. She took his hands and kissed each in deference to his position as high priest. His heart warmed toward her. Freja never set herself above anyone, though she easily could have done so. The people revered her as a goddess among them. Yet it was Freja who often brought him gifts. A woolen blanket in the chill winter, a bowl of roasted pine nuts, a skin of wine, herbs and salves when his bones were aching. Anomia never showed him reverence. She condescended to show him respect only when it served her purposes. I've had another vision, Freja said, her eyes red from weeping. She told him everything from her waking dream. She told him of her son's return. Anomia has told me of these things, he said solemnly. I couldn't see the man clearly, 
It could have been Atreides or the Roman or even someone else. In time, we will know. But what if it's my son? Have you no faith in your own prophecies, Freja? He said gently. Atreides has returned and brought the woman with him, just as you said he would. He will lead our people to peace. Peace, she said softly, craving it with all her heart. And what of the Roman with him? What does one Roman matter? Atreus calls him friend. My own son stands for him and swears to protect him. You know how Varus is. He's bound to hospitality for the moment. But his anger is so great, the hospitality won't last. My sons almost came to blows last night. I'm afraid of what will come of this. Nothing important will come of it. They quarreled. What young men do not? And they made amends. They'll stand together as they always have. Atreides speaks for a new god. A new god? Who will listen? Tiraz is all-powerful. All we know is his dominion, Freja. The sky itself belongs to Tiraz. Doubt assailed her. When she had been caught in the vision, the Roman had merely spoken the name of Jesus Christ, and the spirit that Tiraz had sent upon her had fled her body. She considered telling Gundred what had happened, but she held her silence. She didn't want to be the cause of anyone's death, even a Roman's. She needed to think. She needed to watch and consider. Atreides was involved with this man, and she would do nothing that would jeopardize her son's return to his rightful place as chief of the Chatty. And she prayed fervently that he would do nothing to destroy the people's confidence in him. Seeing her distress, Gundred took her hand and patted it. You are worrying over much about this Roman, Freja. He is one man against many. He will leave. And if he doesn't? Then he will die. <laughs>